there are actually three fundamentally different kinds of conversation. You know, conversation about race, a conversation about sexuality, and a conversation about gender. They're, they're actually all meaningfully different. They've been sort of grouped together, whereas Christians, we sort of need to say no, and also yes, and also no. We're in a place where, as Christians, we need to do two things that I think Christians should be really good at doing, and that is repenting and believing. <laughs> People often have the impression that Christianity is sort of antithetical to women's rights. I actually think that Jesus is the first and best foundation for a full-blooded understanding of women as equal to men in dignity and value. Hi, I'm Glenn from Speak Life. We try to see all things through the lens of Jesus. We are in a series called The Way Back. Is there a way back to Christian faith? in the post-Christian West. And my guest today is Rebecca McLaughlin. She's an author and speaker and lives in New Cambridge out in Massachusetts in the States. Uh, Is that where you are right now, Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, it ought to be called New Cambridge, but they call it only Cambridge here, very confusingly. You know, there's New York, should be New Cambridge. Yeah, because you you were at the old Cambridge. You you kind of, uh, was it English literature and then you did a PhD on that there? Yes, Shakespeare. Seven years of Shakespeare. It was lovely. Oh, do you, do, you, do you wish you were back there? Do, like, what did you want to do with a PhD in Shakespeare? You, like, teach or write or what, what, was the, what was the grand plan? I mean, honestly and truly, I wanted to stay where I was with the opportunities I had to talk about Jesus to people from all over the place. And my college was willing to pay for me to stay on and do a PhD. So I did. I, I, I enjoyed my work, but that wasn't actually the driving motivation for me doing a PhD. Okay. What do you like about university culture? Because you, you've spent a lot of your life around it. I think at its best, it can be a place where people really challenge each other's ideas in a spirit of mutual pursuit of the truth. I realize that, that that's a little bit of a utopian ideal of what university is like. But in many ways, it was something that I experienced, especially in, in the graduate um, level of, of my work, because... I was hanging out with people from all over the world, actually many from Australia, oddly enough, Mm -hmm. who had come to Cambridge to study a whole variety of things. And most of them were not followers of Jesus at all and had principled intellectual and moral reasons for not even considering Christianity. And so getting to interact with really intelligent people who had fundamentally different beliefs, for me, at, at least at the most foundational level, even when there was overlap in in some of our ethical understandings of the world. And being able to challenge each other's ideas in the context of friendship was really special. Yeah. You've got a real gift for uh, befriending people across difference and having good faith conversations with people who don't really share the faith. What are are some of the um, almost sort of pastoral considerations that we ought to have as, as we seek to have good conversations with those who don't share the faith? I think the, the Bible gives us a, a lot of helpful steers on this. You know, one is in, in First Peter where um, we're told always to have a, be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have, but to do so with gentleness and respect. And, and I think especially in conversations that have the potential to get heated because we're talking about things that we are passionate about and maybe uh, our friend or person we're talking to is passionate about, it's easy to get into a space where we're not showing gentleness and respect. And and as Christians, I think we need to continually keep that in mind as we talk and recognize that respecting somebody does mean listening carefully to what they're saying. It doesn't mean agreeing with everything they're saying and affirming everything they're saying, but it does mean listening carefully and trying to understand not only what do they believe, but why do they believe it? You know, what What lies underneath that? both in terms of how they've thought and in terms of how they've experienced life, to really understand this individual person and their beliefs. I think also we have a very clear directive to love in the New Testament. It sounds like a sort of absurdly obvious thing to say. But when Jesus calls us to love even our enemies, we need to recognize that includes everyone who has fierce ideological opposition to to what we we believe actually however they will that um you know jesus calls us to pray for those who persecute us and now i as a 21st century westerner have never experienced like real persecution like nobody is dragging me off to prison nobody is you know threatening my life because of my faith in jesus but i have experienced situations where people have 
you know, said unkind things about me or thought, you know, drawn very hostile conclusions about me because of my faith in Jesus. And in those moments, I have to say to myself, oh, this is, this is one of those moments where I can, in a tiny way, follow Jesus's call to love my enemy. And I think when we approach somebody in love, when we approach somebody with a willingness to listen and a genuine curiosity about their beliefs and, and, and who they are and how they've come to them, we'll find ourselves having much more fruitful conversations about Jesus because in my experience, actually, people are really hungry for deep spiritual conversations. I think it's, it's easy as a Christian to think, well, I can't open my mouth and talk about my faith in Jesus because it's only going to offend people. It's only going to close them down. There's some truth in that. I've certainly had th- that experience. But actually, if people start to see us as someone who is with whom they can have a real conversation about the things that matter to them most, actually, people are really hungry for that. Right. Right. Tell us about the, the cultural moment we find ourselves in. And, and obviously, um, you're kind of in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, you're spending a, a lot of your time uh, around those who are in a college environment. And, and, um, and you're also making an intellectual case for the credibility of Christianity in all sorts of forums, you've, you've just been to Oxford University recently to do their uh, week long of, of missions. Um, and you're, you're reaching out to people in that environment. And we don't want to say that that environment is everywhere. It's not even everywhere in the West. But um, in your corner of the world, how would you characterize our cultural moment? Some people kind of say we are postmodern some people say we're post liberal some people say we're post truth some people say we're post christian some people say we're post secular um where where are we well like put put a pin in the map for us gosh i i'm not sure that i would personally gravitate toward any of those labels for, frustratingly <laughs> frustratingly perhaps <laughs> i think we are in a in a place where we are absolutely having to reckon with pluralism in the sense that we are you know for better or for worse and in some ways i think for for better um inevitably being thrown together with people who who will have very different beliefs shaped by all all sorts of you know experiences um intellectual personal religious etc um it, it needing to find common language and 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 places of shared understanding to sort of start those conversations I think we're in a moment where there is um, a heightened kind of sensitivity and heightened um, quickness to close down conversations. Uh, and that's something that, that can be difficult for Christians to navigate um, as we're increasingly in a world where everything can be you know, harmful. Every, every conversation can, can be talked about as if it is doing you know, real and even, you know, some of the languages used almost sort of physical like violence. harm to somebody. Yes, yes. Um, and so, so there's a heightened awareness of that. I, I think one of the big pieces that, that I, as a, as a Christian, am, am sort of reflecting on and, and trying to um, understand how, how this sort of shapes my experiences of, of conversations with people today is the way in which, especially in America, and I think this flows out into other places as well, but especially in the American context, the way in which the history of slavery and segregation in America and the the injustice done to black Americans, tragically, often by white people who identify as Christian and many you know church leaders and, and church communities, etc. The way in which that history is informing now conversations about um, sexual identity and transgender identity. And I think we need to recognize that the connective tissue there, I think one of the most powerful kind of rhetorical arguments that comes up today in, in all sorts of different, you know, slightly differently nuanced ways, but but to sort of summarize it, is to say, you know, just like you white Christians in the 60s used your Bibles to oppose desegregation of schools or um, marriage between a black person and a white person, so now today you're using your Bibles to oppose um, gay marriage and transgender identity. So there's a sense in which the the moral capital of the civil rights movement has been sort of claimed by first the gay rights movement and then now the, the trans rights movement. And it's it's really easy for, for Christians to sort of see only the, the causes out there, the causes in the world out there that have sort of brought us to this moment where 
you know, maybe not using somebody's preferred pronouns is sort of seen as an act of violence almost against them. Whereas I think some of those outside causes can be true. I think we also just need to recognise like the causes that are kind of from the inside um, and the way in which we are still living with the consequences of of, of historic sin, actually. Um, because whereas there are actually three fundamentally different kinds of of conversation, you know, conversation about race, a conversation about sexuality and a conversation about gender, they're, they're actually all meaningfully different that they've, they've been sort of um, grouped together in a way where as Christians we sort of need to say, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, no, and also yes, and also no. Um, I think in, in, in summary, we're in a place where as Christians we need to do two things that I think Christians should be really good at doing, um, and that is repenting and believing. <laughs> but I think we need to be really willing to do both those things, actually, and not sort of enter into conversations on a self-declared moral high ground. Right. Right. That is that is so helpful because I, I, I think so often we start the clock in the 1960s with a kind of a sexual revolution mm. story mm-hmm. in which, okay, the culture has departed from Christian sexual ethics in that way. And then we almost imagine, therefore, that the only trajectory of the culture is away from yep. morality into yep. immorality or amorality. One of the problems with that framing of things is that it just does not account for what we're encountering in the world. And what we're encountering in the world is not amorality or immorality. Mm. It's an incredibly moral environment, you know, and and as you're saying, um, like having the wrong views or or taking the wrong stance on certain moral issues becomes a, you know, a a kind of a toxicity. It's a violence. It's a we're an incredibly moral society. Now, the, the, the moral vision that we have might not be Scripture's moral vision exactly, but, but it's not the case that we have gone into license since the 1960s. Yeah. Actually, we have a profound moral sense. Where does that come from? And that's so helpful to think about. Well, we'll think about slavery and think about abolitionism and then the civil rights movement and then think about how Stonewall kind of is is connected to the civil rights yeah. movement and then all of a sudden yeah the yeah. the the moral capital of the civil rights movement is is kind of uh, used by or, mm. or or is in the popular imagination shared by the stonewall kind of gay rights and now trans rights and that kind of thing um, that's that's yeah. Doing good history really really does. I'm very glad I asked you to put a pin in the map. Because, yeah, well, yeah. And, and every time we talk as if once upon a time, let's say America was a Christian country, and then the 60s came and there was the you know legalization of abortion and there was the the um, sexual revolution and then every time we tell that story, once upon a time everything was great and then the 60s, we are saying we don't care <laughs> about Black Americans. Because in fact, the 60s was the first time they were getting any measure of justice, right? We're, so, we're, we're actually wiping out a whole category, like a whole area of, of, of moral domain. I mean, people sometimes say like, you know, it must be really hard to raise children in, in you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts in the year 2023 with all these sort of anti-Christian ethical claims and, and pushes, you know, around them. And it is. But actually... Give me this over raising children, you know, a few decades ago when I would be having to say, you know, to be a Christian in school today means crossing over the segregation lines. Like, mm, <laughs> like you know, we, right. we need to recognize the ways in, in which we, um, yeah, we, we, we can't have a view of the past that is, um, you know, painting a, a sort of utopian, like, Christian um, background in when, in fact, whereas there are some ways in which, culture might have been more aligned with with christian ethics there are actually other ways in which it was profoundly misaligned but in some but but i but i think what we where that leaves us now is not in a place of despair and throwing up our hands and saying well we've never got it right so of course we never will i think it could can in, instead put us in a position of saying okay instead of harking back to a nostalgic past we had the opportunity to build a more hopeful future right right as we repent and believe yeah. and continue to repent and continue to believe and that, that that repentance will mean that we do not fall in lockstep with 
the the cultural narrative that's out there, either left or right. Um, they'll, yeah, as we discern the difference between race and sex and gender, and what the gospel demands in yeah. in the domains of race and sex and gender. Um, we will become incomprehensible in some ways, um, not only to the world, but we'll, be, we'll become um, parts of the church that get comfortable leaning one way or the other. Mm. Um, we'll not really know how to look at us. Have you, have you found that as people have <laughs> looked at Rebecca McLaughlin and, and her trying to d- distinguish between these, these three different areas? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that honestly makes you really sad is how often um, after I've maybe given a talk about a uh, Christian view of sexuality, and and I've at the same time uphold what it seems to me to be painfully clear um, from the New Testament that sex belongs in marriage between a man and a woman, um, and that same-sex sexual relationships are in fact completely out of bounds for for followers of Jesus. When I share that, at the same time as saying, um, you know, I'm someone who's always experienced same-sex attraction, and there's an extent to which we're all kind of in the same boat, like regardless of our sexual um, patterns of sexual attraction, most likely all of us will at times find ourselves attracted to someone we're not married to. And we need to decide, you know, what do we do with that? Are we submitting that to Christ or are we, are we following um, where that, that leads? And if I've acknowledged that the ways in which Christians have often, sadly, tragically, sinfully treated gay and lesbian people outside the church and same sex attracted believers within the church, in ways that fall far short of Jesus's call to love, people often say, "Oh, I've never, I've never heard anybody talk like this before." Mm. And I'm thinking, how, yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. how completely yeah. tragic? Because actually, if we open our Bibles, that's what we'll find. We'll find it's fascinating to me, and I want to sort of. This is something you know when you kind of put a mental note in something because you start to see it, and then you think, "Oh, I, I don't have time right now to really dig into that." But I really like this. I, I want to spend a lot of time on this at some point. If you look at the places in particular where Paul calls out sexual immorality, including same-sex sexual immorality, and like makes it very clear this is something that, that Christians need to flee from, and that this ongoing unrepentant sexual sin actually can sort of walk you out of the kingdom of God, you'll often find that adjacent to that is a, is a continued call to brotherly love. You know, when we look at the sort of modern slogan, love is love, we should be experiencing in Christian community, if we are following what the Bible says, we should be experiencing much more love than any, anything outside the church has to offer. And we should be inviting people outside the church into an experience of more love than they will ever find in, in a, a community sort of based on, on a sexual attraction. Um, we are the people, we're the people of love, actually. Uh, and and love, it, the, the particular kind of relationship that people some people are called to in marriage and again not all christians are called to that and we need to be really clear about not not sort of uh, denigrating singleness as we elevate marriage that the particular kind of love that that we're called to in in marriage is is only one of the kinds of love that we're called to as christians and actually we can live a sort of rich and fulfilled life as a christian experiencing the other kinds of love that we're called to even outside even aside from that that marriage relationship yeah yeah should we press into that because uh on the issues of sex and gender um the church uh has not always covered itself in glory uh let's let's put it as mildly as that and um it, it is a real flashpoint i guess um nowadays as people look at the church i think some of the first uh word associations they would do would be things like misogynistic or patriarchal um denigrating of women um you have uh you've you've written a great book called jesus through the eyes of women um can you tell us why you have sought to really hone in on jesus as your first kind of answer to that question about the church and women and christianity Mm. um it, because it, it, it's a heartwarming book because you, you focus in on Jesus mm. through the eyes of women. And I, and I think it's, it's quite a disarming approach. Tell, it, tell us why you went that direction. 
people often have the impression that Christianity is sort of uh, antithetical to women's rights or pulling us away from uh, equality for women and, and you know, true true valuing, valuing of women. I actually think that Jesus is the the first and best foundation for a a full blooded understanding of women as equal to men um um in 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 dignity and value in in purpose um in uh spiritual appetite and and intellectual capability and all all the other you know ev- everything that we could say in that realm um it, it's easy for us today to think that the idea that men and women are fundamentally equal in value is like a self-evident truth that you don't need any particular religious or even philosophical foundation to believe that it's like basic moral common sense if you go back to the ancient world it wasn't common sense at all i mean is that what was common sense was that men were more important than women that men were more valuable than women and you know every like pretty much every every way and this played out in all sorts of ways including the you know the fact that it was it was okay to abandon your infants um and you know, especially if you had a baby girl and you were kind of hoping to have a baby boy, then more than okay to leave your baby girl to die or to be picked up and raised as a slave or a prostitute by somebody else. Like, fine. Jesus's treatment of women was revolutionary. And, and Jesus in particular seems to, I mean, he, Jesus um, welcomed women of all kinds, uh, including, you know, very high status women, um, like like Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, who we see in um, Luke's gospel in particular, sort of highlighted as one of Jesus's followers. He'd sort of left the court, it seems, to traipse around the, the countryside with Jesus and his his band of, of disciples. Um, but, but also women who would have been seen as completely like beyond the pale. You know, Jesus spent time with people with whom he should not have been seen dead. And that is especially true when it comes to women. You know, one example is his famous conversation in, in John's Gospel with a Samaritan woman at a well. And even she is shocked by the fact that Jesus is sort of starting this conversation with her and, and asks her for a, a glass of water because she's like, wait a minute, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? There are so many problems with this. Jews don't associate with the Samaritans. A respectable Jewish rabbi shouldn't be having this chit chat with this this woman. And as the conversation progresses, we find that Jesus knew from the first that she had had five husbands and she was now living with a man who was not her husband. So, so truly, I mean, she was uh, beyond the bounds in in every way that she could have been. And yet Jesus has with her his longest private recorded conversation in all of the Gospels. She's the first person in John's Gospel to whom Jesus explicitly reveals himself as the Christ, the Messiah. She's also, if you look, if you look sort of at the Greek, she's the, um, the person to whom he says one of his famous kind of I am statements where he's channeling the covenant name of God from the Old Testament. Um, she says to him at the end, you know, I know that when Messiah comes, um, he will reveal everything to us. And Jesus says, I am the one speaking to you. Um, so this is one example uh, uh, among many, and that's kind of why I wanted to write a book about it, of interactions Jesus has with women where not only does he think they're kind of worth spending time with, but he thinks they're worth having like real theological conversations with. And he, he's willing to defend and protect and, and, and dignify women when they are under attack um, often from self-righteous men. So in another story I love is in, in Luke's gospel. Depending on the day, I either love John's gospel or Luke's gospel the most. My son is called Luke because I love Luke's gospel so much. But today I actually love John's gospel more. Um, <laughs> there's a, a beautiful story in Luke's gospel where Jesus is, is having dinner with a Pharisee called Simon. And usually the Pharisees don't want, like they're usually telling Jesus off rather than inviting him for dinner. But this guy, you know, Simon's invited him around for dinner. And during the meal, this woman comes in who Luke describes as a, quote, sinful woman of the city and starts washing Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair and pouring. And, you know, it's like, this is really embarrassing. And Simon says, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. You know, if Jesus is really from God, he wouldn't want anything to do with this woman, is, is, is Simon's understanding. And Jesus goes on to not only to sort of validate this woman, but actually he holds her up as a as an example to Simon's death. He does a like compare and contrast <laughs> point by point with between her and Simon. And she is the one who comes out of this comparison well. 
um, we then see see Jesus at the uh, at the end of his life on earth um, with women as the the primary named witnesses of the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of of Jesus. Um, and so we see like a, both at the beginning and the end of his life on earth, actually, because of course at the beginning we have um, Mary, Jesus' mother, and Elizabeth, his his relative, um, who seem to be given sort of prophetic insight to who Jesus is, you know, both by a direct visit from an angel in Mary's case and then um, by being filled with the Holy Spirit in Elizabeth's case, we see the prophetess Anna um, in the temple who received Jesus as, as a baby. So we see sort of both the beginning, the beginning, middle and the end of his life, you know, at every point we see Jesus relating to women um, and whereas it, it might seem like a kind of more modern project to say, well, let's look at Jesus through the eyes of women as a sort of marginalized group at the time. It's actually precisely what the gospel authors are inviting us to do is they name women as eyewitnesses at key points in Jesus's life and ministry. Yes. Yeah. And why do they do that when the testimony of a woman was worth half that of a man in, yeah. in legal settings? It, it culturally um, it would have been set aside because this is the witness of women and yet Jesus specifically commissions people like Mary yeah. to be witnesses of the resurrection. Do you, do you see a, a great significance in that? Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's one of the signs of authenticity in the Gospels um, to me, along with the, the deeply embarrassing portrayal of, of the male apostles who go on to be, you know, foundational leaders in the church <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. poor peter i think of i, I think of him um his incredible like m- his moment of greatest failure when he denies that he even knows jesus three times the fact that that is recorded in in all of the gospels and, and in, in particular in mark's gospel which seems likely to have been based on peter's own memories um he has no problem with saying I'm a moral failure and Jesus is the hero of this story. Um, but frankly, that's not, I mean, honestly, if I'd been Peter, I think I would probably have tactfully missed yeah. that part out, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can we keep that quiet? Let's, yeah. Yeah. So many other things yeah, we could I, tell about Jesus. Let's let's skip that part. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so the criterion of embarrassment that uh, if this was concocted, you would not invent embarrassing things. And the fact that um, the gospel writers wanted to keep them in means mm. uh, a remarkable kind of dedication to truth. And then the fact that um, women are counted as the first witnesses to the resurrection, yeah. really, in a, in a culture in which their testimony was not um, considered equal. Um, they, they kind of tilt you towards... Um, taking the four canonical Gospels very seriously. Um, you do mention in the book early on um, the Gospel of Mary mm. and and an example of, you know, one of the Gnostic Gospels. Um, and obviously Thomas as well, the Gospel of Thomas, um, is another um, Gnostic Gospel. So um, not one of the canonical Gospels, not written um, uh within the, the, the lifetime of, of the, the eyewitnesses of Jesus, um, not narrating any of the events that Jesus actually performed, but the, they are they tend to be sort of the sayings of Jesus, mm. sort of this sort of wisdom that is sort of bestowed from on high kind of thing. Um, but in those Gnostic Gospels, women don't come across uh, in the same way, do they? Yeah, the, it, it, a couple of... Um ideas have been popularized one is that the four gospels in our bibles were sort of selected for political reasons or something from a a larger group of equally valid options um you know probably far after um you know after any of them were written and and that turns out to be actually just not true as you as you've pointed out so the the four gospels in our in our bibles um are certainly the the best historical evidence we have about jesus in terms of um you know in terms of just a, a purely historical analysis of them um, as as biographies of, of Jesus. You know, they they outcompete any other potential rivals by by quite a clear margin. Um, but the other the other narrative that's become popular, as you mentioned, is this idea that whereas the New Testament is fundamentally misogynistic, these other so called gospels um, present us with a much more sort of feminist view of Christianity that was probably squashed and squeezed away um by the the male leaders of the early church because they didn't want to you know didn't want to deal with that 
in actual fact, you find some sort of oddly misogynistic moments in, in some of these um, non-canonical gospels. Um, and you find, as I say, in the, the actual gospels in our, in our Bibles, um, an extraordinary and countercultural validation of women um, that, that we're still feeling the effects of positively today. It's, it's fascinating. It seems like from the very beginning, you know, from the earliest records we have of, of the early church, it seems like there have always been more Christian women than men. Um, and that seems that continues to be the case today, even as we look you know, across the, the world to China, where the, the church in China is growing so fast that there will very soon be more Christians in China than in America. And um, at least one leading sociologist of religion in China thinks that China could be a majority Christian country by about 2060. Um, the church in China is very disproportionately female. And, and, and this isn't just because, you know, oh, of course, women are more religious than men. Actually, if you compare Christianity to Islam and Hinduism, the two other kind of largest global religions um, or world religions in terms of their um, their number of followers, I corrected to to world rather than global because actually Hinduism is very strongly focused in India and a couple of other countries. Um, you find that that whereas Christianity is disproportionately female, and both in terms of the the people who say they're Christians and in terms of the people who are actually like showing up to religious services and praying and all that sort of thing, if you look at Islam and Hinduism, that's not the case. So it, it does seem like there's something particularly attractive about Jesus um, to to women, and that's always been the case. Hmm. I um. Yeah. I mean, there's Celsus uh, kind of. Uh, early critic of the church, kind of saying it's it's only um, it's only slaves, women, and children yeah. who end up following the these these Jewish myths. Um, well, and that Christians cool. aren't even seeming like they're trying <laughs> with the <laughs> with the ma- you know with the free men. Um, right. You know they want and are able to convince only women, slaves, and little children, which I find I find especially interesting. Um, you know, Jesus in 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 Luke's gospel in his first recorded sermon in his hometown, sort of synagogue of, of Nazareth, reads out this um, prophecy from Isaiah where he's talking about bringing good news to the poor. And, and I think there is a a real sense in which that you know was true then and is, is true now that Christianity is disproportionately for those who are not, um, you know, rich and prosperous and um, kind of benefiting from... Uh, privilege, privilege. Uh, to use a, a weighted yeah. term in yeah. society that we, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the only reason why we have that sort of narrative and discourse around privilege is because we've been utterly Christianized in our sense yeah. of equality and compassion and those those sorts of values. Um, so you're having a conversation with a, a friend who has picked up in the water and, and perhaps picked up from personal experience and perhaps for very good reasons um, that Christianity uh, might not have women's best interests at heart. Mm. Um, is that is that your first move to get to kind of go back to Jesus and, and talk to them about, you know, the Gospels? Um, what, what, what else are you kind of doing in a conversation uh, to, to talk to people about the credibility of Christian faith? Yeah, I mean, I, I do tend to always draw people back to Jesus because I think Jesus um, truly is the the answer uh, when it comes to uh, any of these ethical questions. Um, one of the the pressure points um, to state the the kind of bleeding obvious, as we would say in England, is the the fact that that Christianity from the first has been um, has believed that even babies. Uh, are made in the image of God and deserve protection and um, you know ha- and and have innate value even aside from any value their parents might attach to them. And today, because the supposed um, right to have an abortion has become in people's minds a sort of central plank of women's rights, um, the the fact that Christianity is so strongly pro life um, is associated in people's minds with it being strongly anti women. And I think this is a this is a scenario where we need to bring um, gentleness and respect and and a desire to understand what the other person believes and why. Because I think one of the big mistakes that that Christians have often made and that and that people on on the other side of the fence, as it were, have often made, is to 
be completely unable to understand how somebody who is highly intelligent and um, has good moral intentions could have come to a fundamentally different conclusion that, than than we do when it comes to what an unborn baby is. Um, you know, is this a, is this a human being with human dignity and rights, or or is this um, is this not? And as, as I talk with um, with friends who are passionately pro-choice, you know, just as I am passionately pro-life, if I approach that conversation and say, "Well, you're just a baby murderer who doesn't care about the vulnerable," I'm actually profoundly misrepresenting their their view um this is not because i think abortion is a kind of agree to disagree issue or because i don't feel like profoundly convinced that an unborn baby is in fact being made in the image of god a human being made in the image of god and deserving you know full rights and protection but because if if jesus isn't who he says he is and if there is not a god who made the universe and made human beings male male and female in his image and did not love us enough to send his son to die for us then the baby in the womb is just a collection of like a bundle of cells or a collection of atoms and molecules but at the same time if jesus isn't who he says he is if if there isn't a god who made the universe and created human beings male and female in his image and loved us enough to send a son to die for us then that is just what the mother is as well we actually we find ourselves in conversations where um, we're sort of being asked, you know, do you care about the mother or do you care about the baby? And as Christians, we need to say a passionate both and we need to mean it. We need to show that in our actions. But we also need to recognize that, um, that it's the same moral motivation that, that causes us to care about an unborn baby as causes us to care about that baby's mother especially if that baby's mother is 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 poor and under supported which is true of the large majority of women in america who opt to have an abortion yeah yeah and is there a way back even as we have that conversation because uh the first person i interviewed in this series the way back was mary harrington and uh she is a reactionary feminist um and so her, her latest book is called feminism against progress hmm. And um, fa- she's a fascinating person who kind of does a history of feminism in terms of there, there has always been a feminism of care and a feminism of autonomy. Mm. And these have kind of been parallel tracks of feminism. Mm. And in, in the 19th, 19th century, the, the sort of the cult of domesticity was a kind of feminism Mm. and the temperance movement was a kind of feminism and it was basically those who said that um the there is a domain to female life that needs honoring and protecting and Mm -hmm. sometimes that means you know telling men to stop drinking you know drinking the paycheck and and beating them and the and there is a a kind of a cult of domesticity and and there's there's a there's a way of expressing femininity in terms of care and interdependence, but that that feminism has been tr- trumped really by a, a feminism of autonomy, mm-hmm. in which the the whole goal is independence and choice. And come the sexual revolution, um, that that absolutely took the ascendancy, such that now we can't even look at the cult of the cult of domesticity or the temperance movement or anything like that as anything like feminist because it just doesn't fit the autonomous choice model. Mm-hmm. And now we think of feminism and choice as tightly bound together. And and she talks about all sorts of um, economic reasons why that might be and technological reasons why that might be. But she speaks very um, winningly about how pregnancy... Um, confirmed a lot of the the spiritual and philosophical developments that she was making that very clearly with in her own experience of pregnancy her interdependence with a life that um uh, was woven into hers that 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 there's an exchange of dna between mother and child and she's embodied and it it kind of destroyed her feminism of of autonomy Hmm. And I, and I wonder whether that's kind of 
where a, where a major clash is, the sort of autonomy and choice and pregnancy um, really are at odds with one another because that's not how babies are made. Autonomy is not how babies are made or carried or brought to brought to. Brought well, to I mean, yes and no. Uh, at the same time, I think we need to see in Christianity the origin of the idea that a woman has a, a right of autonomy over her body to say no to unwanted sexual intercourse. Right. Like actually, like yes. The, yes. The, the idea of consent when it comes to sex from a woman's perspective is something that has been brought to us by Christianity. So in, there's a sense in which I don't know that I'd want to trade off kind of our autonomy and, and inter- interdependence. There, there's, there's, there's one sense in which, of course, like every time we, we choose to be, um, to kind of free ourselves from all constraint, we're actually walking ourselves away from community. So there, there's, for all of us, male and female, there's actually that kind of balancing act of, of intimacy and autonomy. We'll often, we'll, we'll need to trade those two off um, one way and another. And as Christians, I think we're actually called to sort of lean into intimacy, like lean into community and to and to constraint rather than just sort of, you know, following our own, um, you know, merry individual path, um, which which pulls us away from that. I think it, it, a couple of other things that, that fascinate me. One is that if you look at Jesus's interactions with women in the Gospels, most of the time we actually don't even know whether this woman was married and had children or not. Like a lot of the time... Um, the 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 woman is being engaged with sort of on on her own or in her own right um which is not to say that marriage and having children is is not an, a really important thing and like a profoundly beautiful thing but it, but which is true for both men and for women um but i think it does give us even in 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 the scriptures a strong license to say actually following jesus as a woman's first first call um, and some women will follow Jesus as a wife and a mother. Some people will follow Jesus as a as a single person. Um, both are like equally valid ways of, of of living as followers of Jesus. And and I think one of the which I'm, I'm guessing your previous guest would would strongly agree with one of the the really tricky pieces of data that contemporary feminists are having to reckon with is quite how unhappy especially liberal women today are um you know if we look at if if you compare um you know in the u.s women's self-reported happiness sort of prior to the sexual revolution and and now we find that women are actually taking a hit in terms of self-reported happiness and what we have created in terms of how we've sort of reshaped culture to say yeah sex is a sort of in something independent from commitment We've actually, in some ways, created the sort of worst version of a world that a man might want. Yeah, I don't think it's actually yeah. good for men either. No, but, but it's especially good for women. There's a lot of data that increasing our numbers of sexual partners as women is like correlated with negative mental health outcomes. Um, and 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 when you pull, um, when you sort of pull all uh, laws, whether sort of formal laws or, or just kind of cultural laws, out of a situation, what you in fact do is privilege the strong. You know, the strong and the rich and the powerful don't need laws to protect them. They can protect themselves. It's, it's the poor and the weak and the vulnerable who do. And when it comes to sort of sexual dynamics, women are, you know, physically weaker than men. Um, it's extraordinarily hard for a woman to rape a man. It's actually terribly easy for a man to, to rape a woman in nine cases out of ten. And so, so the more that we have kind of pulled any sort of norms and constraints out of the, the kind of the way that people relate to each other sexually, the more we have basically given men a a free check. Um, I read a, a, a fascinating and sort of painful book by a woman called Christine Ember um, a few months ago. I think it's called Reclaiming Sex, where she has you know, interviewed a lot of uh, educated, sort of, um, you know, well, like in, in many external ways, sort of privileged women in her networks in DC and New York and whatever, and found that whereas uh, most of the sexual interactions they're having are at like some basic level consensual certainly not all i mean it's frightening how many women in fact get like straight up raped but but even sort of setting that aside um the the social pressure on women to consent to relationships that actually they really don't want is very high and she was pointing to you know multiple interviews she had with women who were basically saying 
they kind of felt bad about the fact that they didn't enjoy some of the violent ways in which men were supposedly enjoying sex with them. Like we've, that's the culture that we've created um, where, where we've actually deeply disempowered women in terms of the sort of cultural nudges all around them. Um, and we made them feel really kind of bad for saying, actually, no, I don't want any part of this. Um, so, so yeah, I think we've created a sort of sexual economy, for want of a better word, that's profoundly bad for women in the name of women's rights. Um, but I don't think the fix for that is then like, you know, let's go back to the 50s. I think the fix is, as always, let's open open our Bibles and see what, what we find there and how it might apply to our situation today. Yes, yeah. And that resonates so much with uh, another interview we've done here on the channel, Louise Perry and The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a harrowing book about mm. where the, the 1960s sexual rev- revolution has gotten us. Um, and interestingly, I mean, she she too will say, okay, but, you know, one thing that we've gained since the 60s has been the category of marital rape mm. um, that's um, written into law now it's you know marriage is not consent mm-hmm. um, consent is required <laughs> of marriage partners every single time and and what's fascinating to me is that that's kind of catching up with what the apostle Paul wrote in like 1 Corinthians chapter 7 mm. 19, 1900 years earlier that, that mutual consent was kind of woven into the biblical sexual ethics um, and so, yeah, do we, do we need to get back to the 1950s? Uh, no, but getting back to our Bibles would help as mm. we kind of, like, move forwards with things. Um, I've got time for one more question. Is that all right? Sure. Do you have time? Yeah. So uh, are you seeing people, modern people, in the 21st century um, who are coming from kind of secular backgrounds and finding faith in Jesus, are, are, are there some stories you can um, encourage us with? And, and if so, are, are there any themes that you're noticing in those stories? Gosh, so many stories. Um, and they run the full gamut, actually, from people who um, basically experience divine intervention, like uh, my, my best friend Rachel, who became a Christian, from a like lesbian atheist background when she was an undergrad at Yale after stealing a copy of Mere Christianity from a lapsed Catholic friend's shelf with nobody trying to convert her, um, you know, and, and God just sort of speaking to her uh, and turning her life around. We'll so put that, the links to, to that story. Yeah, yeah it's such a good story. Can, yeah, um, yeah. So, so there's, there's that. There's a, a um, fellow countrywoman of yours, um, my friend Sarah Irv- Irving Stonebreaker, who I don't know if you've interviewed Hey, yeah, but she has an amazing. I need to. Yeah, you mm. need to. She is. Uh, when I was a postgrad um, at Cambridge, she was also a postgrad at Cambridge. Convinced atheist, um, raised by lovely, very secular parents. Um, uh, thought the Christianity was antithetical to all, um, you know, all the good things in terms of, of, of human rights. Certainly would have seen Christianity as misogynistic, etc. Um, went to Oxford and became a Christian in part due to going to some lectures by famous atheist. Um, Australian philosopher Peter Singer, um, who who helped her to see that her deepest moral convictions were actually opposed by her atheism rather than supported by it, and that Christianity was was the the best foundation she had. Um, so so those sort of stories on on the one hand, and then on the other hand, just the the power of Christian community and of some of the very basic and um, in some sense old-fashioned uh, ways of, of inviting people into that. Um, a, a year and a half ago, um, my family and I went around our neighbourhood and sort of knocked on people's doors, inviting them to Chris, uh, Christmas carol services, gave them a copy of a little book I'd just written about Christmas. Um, and, and one of the women who whose door we knocked on, um, was a recent graduate from Stanford University, had moved over to Cambridge for her her first job um and and has ever since then been coming to like bible study with us um you know hasn't yet repented and believed in in Jesus her, her background is 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 Jewish and she sort of certainly believes in God and is sort of figuring stuff out but but her openness and the openness of others I mean we have a weekly bible study on Tuesday nights and we have like multiple non-Christians in in the group um who will comment on the ways in which 
experience of Christian community has actually helped them to to rethink questions of of faith. Um, I, I think one of the m- most powerful tools that we have as Christians is love. Um, the, the love that, that God has poured into us, that we are to pour out into others. Um, the, the love that we can experience with brothers and sisters, which Jesus says is going to be how people will know that we're his disciples by the way that we love one another. And I think inviting other people into that um, is, is one of the, the most um, provocative, powerful um, and persuasive things that we can do when it comes to sharing our faith in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, that's so helpful. I, I love the way you've, you've brought us back to uh, the character, uh, our character as we share our faith, gentleness and respect from 1 Peter, love from all over the New Testament. I love that you're drawing us back to community and um, just the power of actual Christian community. And, and I love that you've, you've written this book and drawn us back to the person of Jesus, mm. um, that when we encounter him, uh, things change, and uh, I, I was certainly really blessed by um, reading the book, Rebecca. Thank you so much for writing it. I hope lots of other people are blessed by that because it just it forces you to kind of look again at the biblical Jesus, mm-hmm. and you just think, fantastic, I, I want to follow him all over again. Yeah. Uh, and we can. We can repent and believe every day. So, uh, Rebecca, thank you so much uh, for joining us. That's and uh, if people want to uh, keep up with your work, what's the best thing that they can do? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I mean, I post on Twitter with some frequency, if you can bear <laughs> entering into that world. Um, I have a, a newsletter on my website, which uh, comes out very sporadically, um, usually when I've written a book. <laughs> but you can sign up for that if you feel so moved. Um, what yeah, is your What is your website? Is that the Confronting Christianity one? Uh, it's RebeccaMcLaughlin.org. I think at some point it will turn into Confronting. Oh, I also have a podcast. I'm forgetting that. Called there Confronting Christianity. Pod- <laughs> oh, everyone's got a pod. Everyone's got a podcast. I know everyone and their dog has a podcast these days. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, talked into it. Search for Rebecca McLaughlin on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Glenn. 